Well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time out today. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Jessica Crate. I'm a former athlete. I ran varsity track and cross country for Arizona State and Florida State and then jumped into the corporate world and have been an entrepreneur since and have been, you know, after injury, went into training and coaching athletes. So I love coaching and training athletes. One of my passions is a nonprofit I work with called Girls on the Run. And so today I'm really excited to go through the Elm Tree of Mastery with you all um, because this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I'm passionate about it. And I think being part of PCA, you're going to find out why we as an organization are passionate about it as well. So today let's dive into it. Um, we're going to start with a, a video by Carol Dweck. She is a psychology professor at Stanford <laughs> University. And so as you listen to her, think about the most important thing that she says in this video. So let's play this. Okay. Awesome. So after this video, you guys have seen this. Um, what does this do for you? What, what about this video really stands out to you? What is the most important thing? Kelly, Ruben, Alan, what is the most important thing that you think she said in this video? I think what hit me was when she said that most coaches think it's obvious players know that they value effort because I realized, you know, my players might not know that I do. Like, I don't know if I make anything very obvious. Um, I assume they know, but I don't know what I do to intentionally show them that. That's so key. Yeah, that's one of the main points I took out of it as well. You know, coaches who value effort and practice more than just talent, you know, their teams just tend to improve more. So fantastic point. You know, another thing I loved and just to point out is the athletes don't always understand that their coaches value effort. So making sure that you um, make that transparent and apparent with your athletes is so key. So let's jump into it. Jessica, shouldn't you reward the the results i mean isn't that what the kids are playing for absolutely you know i think rewarding their effort though over just you know when they win is is something we're going to dive into in creating a meaningful athlete experience but that's a great point thanks so much for bringing that up alan so a meaningful athlete experience you know how do athletes how do you get athletes to believe they can get better so Carol Dweck's research is part of the strong evidence that shows that we can get athletes to believe they can get better. And the first point is to tell the athletes that we value effort more than talent. So um, the first piece in this is to tell them that. And I'm getting a little bit, bit of an echo. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. I can mute if you want. Um, so reinforce this over and over and by telling them that we call a noticer of effort. So look for effort and this goes to your point, Alan, and compliment it whenever you see it, no matter what the outcome, if it was successful or not, you, see, you know, rewarding behaviors, but it's key to reward the effort piece. And then finally, it's important that in our comments to those players that we attribute success to effort. So, you know, this is, um, you know, something that you guys can use is that was a great play. You've been working hard in practice and it shows. Maybe they missed the goal and they're playing soccer, but I know for me as an athlete, you know, I, I love when a coach is like, okay, even though you screwed up and you sucked, you're actually, you know, putting forth a good effort. So um, that's so key. So let's dive into this. This is the Elm Tree of Mastery, and it really focuses on peak performance versus winning. And this principle is based on over 20 years of sports psychology research. So as a former athlete, as a coach now, and I monitored in psychology, I really understand the importance of the Elm Tree. And I think it's gonna be a great tool for you to incorporate into what you do on a day-to-day -day basis as well. So let's compare and contrast a scoreboard. This is a scoreboard definition versus a mastery definition of winning. And with PCA, we really want to make sure that you understand why the scoreboard definition is not what we focus on. So the scoreboard definition is concerned with results. And what we call the mastery definition focuses more on effort. And so, for example, you know, how hard am I trying? Effort is tied to commitment. So you know just how committed are your athletes. And do you praise that? So ask yourself, you know, in, in my coaching, in my training, you know, am I asking my, how committed are my athletes? Do I know? And how do I gauge that? So the scoreboard definition also focuses on comparisons with others. So am I better than him? Is she better than me? 
Um, are they doing better than I am? Are they scoring more? Whereas the mastery definition focuses on learning and improvement. And for those of you, you know, you some of you are teachers. If you focus on teaching, you know, what will you focus on to evaluate in your term of effectiveness? So learning. And then finally, there's the issue of mistakes. So in a scoreboard environment, mistakes are not okay. In a mastery environment, mistakes are okay. So Alan, for you, um, when your athletes perform, what do you think that they fear the most? Well, they fear losing mm -hmm. and making mistakes, which can cause losing. Mm -hmm. So how do I how do I keep them from thinking that their mistake might cause us a game? So that's a great question. So when you're going into it, you know, when most people think, you know, failure or messing up and they think that if they fail or if they make a mistake, they're going to like slander the game and they're not going to do well. So I think, you know, often you know, we, we have been yelled at or our coaches scream at you and, you know, if you mess up, it's like a tragic ending. But I think to reiterate that we're not just saying to correct mistakes, but in PCA we're saying to not punish them for that. So that way you're able to coach them through something and say, okay, you know, you made a mistake, but this is a learning piece. And we're going to dive into some tools that you can use to really help your athletes. So let's look at this next slide and what we can do in a mastery climate to really help you be a more effective coach and to help your athletes understand that mistakes are okay and that they can continue to move forward to the next play because that's the most important. So the mastery climate is key. We can conclude that in moments of peak performance, the fear of failure is erased. And with that barrier removed, anxiety goes down and self-confidence goes back up. So, you know, not only do we know this, but it is supported by 25 years of research, including the work done by Robert Rozier of Stanford University. So, this is key because the elm tree of mastery, you know, we want, especially in your case, Alan, mastery gives players a feeling of control. It puts their focus on things that they can control. So control is a key point here because we have so much more control over mastery winning than scoreboard winning. So kids are more confident. They'll be less anxious in a mastery environment. And, you know, what we're going to talk about is working harder and then sticking to it longer. So... I love this because we know from research done by Albert Bandura that everything else being equal, a child with higher self-confidence will work harder and stick to the task longer. So this is more of a reason um, in every scenario to be a more mastery-oriented coach. The bottom line is that coaches who coach their athletes to pursue mastery get better results than coaches who just coach to win on the scoreboard. Um, because we really want those athletes to get that feeling that no matter what your environment, even if you are losing, to put forth your best effort and to continue to play at that level. So let's jump into this scenario. We're going to tie, tie this into a scenario that um, you guys can use. So I want you guys to pair up. Kelly, Alan, Ruben, all pair up together in a big tripod. <laughs> Awesome. So your team tends to play tentatively and let the opponent drive the action. Um, what can you do? Yell so, and scream until they play better. Oh no, Ruben. What do you What do you think? Would you Would you do what Alan's talking about? <laughs> um. Well, uh, I think uh, I would go back to what you said earlier about. Um, you know what uh, trying to get them to focus on the things that uh, that that we're in control of mm -hmm. um, I think that's what I would try to do talk to them about that fantastic Kelly um, when I had this happen I just asked the kids like what's going on you know what what's going you know just to find out from them kind of what's happening and why they're why they're a little bit nervous why are they worried and you know then respond based on that so sometimes they might say well the other team's killing us you know they're better than we are they're bigger than we are and mm -hmm. then i would just reinforce for them all the things that they've been doing well fantastic so some key pca takeaways that relate to this scenario are really what both of you just said you know alan take these write these points down these are great <laughs> 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 uh, focusing on oh, effort. Not working. <laughs> focusing on effort is key to performance. So 
you know, the assertion, being aggressive when it comes, really just comes when there's no fear of mistakes. So um, if you open your books, you can go to page 27. Um, but players who are afraid to make mistakes will play tentatively. Players who are not afraid to make mistakes will be freed up to play aggressively. So let's take a look at some of these tools. And Alan, I told you I would get to these, so here we are. Um, these tools really make Elm come to life in our coaching. And so being a noticer of effort. You know, I mentioned this earlier, how important it is to be a noticer of effort so that our athletes can understand how much we as coaches just value effort. A related tool is reward effort, and especially unsuccessful effort. As crazy as that might sound for, for this, you know, let's talk about page 27. Do, do any of you have your book? Can somebody read page 27? Mm -hmm. Read page 27. <laughs> no, I'm like, I'm looking Demo around. Jump at once. <laughs> Je Jessica, where, <laughs> Jessica, I have it. Where do you want me to start reading from? Perfect. So the first line under um, maximize. I pile of books in my house. <laughs> maximize <laughs> effort by rewarding unsuccessful effort. If you can start there. All coaches reward players who make the play. It sounds crazy, but to maximize team effort, reward players who try hard but fail to make the play. Boom. That's so key. Thanks so much. So really, how does a player get rewarded when they make a successful play? So the feeling of self-satisfaction, accomplishment, praise from a coach and their teammates, you know, cheering of spectators. So there are built-in rewards for effort that result in a successful play. But what about when they make a great effort that doesn't result in that? So how can we as coaches give genuine praise for that effort? So if we want to maximize player effort, we must reward players who try hard but fail to make the play. And this is so key because, you know, especially when we're talking, Alan, there's always ways to find um, players that have been making unsuccessful effort in their play. But you know, you can always find a way to reward them by just giving them good praise, genuinely. And so finding ways to be authentic in your praise is very key. So the next one is mistake ritual. You know, mistakes can be like a time machine and they can keep an athlete's focus on something that has already happened instead of the most important play. And I know for me as a runner, if I didn't win a race, I'll go replay that race over and over in my mind. And it was a coach that thrust me out of that scenario and said, hey, you don't play that over, let's learn from it and then erase it and move on to the next thing. And so a mistake ritual is a gesture phase that coaches and players can use to remind themselves that mistakes are okay. And really, what's the most important play? The next one. So allowing people to say, okay, here as a coach, here as an athlete, mistakes are okay. Communicate that they're moving on to the next one. And so some of these examples, we're going to jump into a video here in a second, but a couple of them that I love are the flush it, you know, wipe the brow, no sweat, and brush it off. And allowing your athletes to go, okay, you know, stay in the game, work hard, continue to focus on the effort and putting in and getting better and not allowing these mistakes to hold you back from being fearful and moving on to the next one. So we're going to watch as this next PCA advisory board member and a New York Mets major league baseball player, Curtis Granderson, explains a mistake ritual that he uses to move on to the next play. So let's check out his video. So this video, guys, is one of my favorites because I think it's hilarious that a even a high-performing athlete had a little pretend toilet that he just flushed down, and I think it's a great idea. So get creative. You know, the little mini toilet idea is great. So even the highest-level athletes use mistake rituals to help them play well. So get creative. Have fun. Are there any things that you guys use in your coaching currently um, that have allow you to have the opportunity to – find and get creative and have fun with mistake rituals well sh shouldn't we ignore the mistakes ignore because the mistake? then they'll forget about them and get about them and... um i think if you ignore mistakes what would that do with your athletes well, i think then then they will just they will just put it out of their mind and, and have you have you incorporated that currently it's not working very well. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, as we understand with this, I think, you know, for, you know, if you're ignoring the mistakes rather than addressing them, either the athlete will play over in their mind psychologically and say, is that a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Did I, am I learning from this? Did he even notice that I made a mistake? And I think as, you know, as a coach, you know, really just honing in on mistakes and saying, okay, even if it is a mistake, what can we learn from it? Let's address it and then quickly either flush it, brush it off or let it, you know, move on to the next thing, but finding ways to address those mistakes with your athletes so that they know that they're improving, that we're focusing more on the effort, not just you didn't make the goal. Well, if they didn't make the goal, they made a mistake, right? So how can we address that properly? Because there's opportunities to reinforce unsuccessful effort in every sport, no matter what sport you're playing. So if we can find those little niches where we can go, hey, you know, good job on, you know, using that swift kick that we've been practicing. But even though they've made a mistake, you know, finding ways to really teach them that, hey, they're working hard, they're improving, your whole team will come together. So Ruben and, Ruben and, and Kelly, are you, Kelly, are you guys found, found a way, found a way to incorporate the mistake ritual in your coaching practice? practice. So, yeah, you just got really fuzzy. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. Was that me? Yeah. Okay. So on my team, Jessica, we, we, um, we talk about next play, next play, and then we will often go like this, uh, symbolizing like we're, we're, we're moving on to the next page, turning mm -hmm. the page. But we're, 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 next play. Love it. Mm -hmm. So focus. I had a different oh, – sorry. Go ahead. I had a different situation um, last year with my team. I had little guys, like third graders, and oh. I had a couple kids whose parents made them play that mm -hmm. they didn't really want to be there. So my issue mm -hmm. was not brushing off mistakes. My issue was them to care that they made mistakes because I had mm. some kids like I was all ready to reinforce, you know, it's okay that you made a mistake, move on. And I had like two or three girls that would just make mistakes all over the place and they could care less. So it was sort of an opposite challenge of this. I didn't need a mistake ritual. I needed them to realize that mistakes you know, you, you've got to at least try to make mistakes. So we worked Absolutely. a lot on, on effort, but when they made a the mistake, they were like, oh, who cares? I dropped the ball. It's not a big deal. That's and I was like, no, it does matter. Yeah. A little. <laughs> That's also a great point. Both of you. Like, so understanding, yes, you can make mistakes, but why are we making mistakes? And is there a purpose and a goal to doing this? So I love it. You know, opportunities, uh, to reinforce this unsuccessful effort or even just effort in general abound in every sport. So find creative ways to do that. Um, get out of your comfort zone, get creative and really enjoy the coaching piece and helping your athletes move through the journey because sport is a journey, right? So the Elm tree is a fantastic tool and place for you guys to start. So thanks so much for joining me today. The next um, piece is integrity, honoring the game. So I'll let you guys dive into that at the next session, but it's been an honor to be here with you guys today. And I look forward to coming back next month. All right. All right. Well done. Well done. Perfect timing. Perfect. How'd you feel going through How'd that? You feel going through that? It's good. I, I like it. Um, mm -hmm. Minus a stuffy nose. I'm sorry. I was getting a little That's feedback, okay. <laughs> so I hope you guys could hear me okay. No, nope, it was good. It was. It was. Now, now what, I remember last time we had some suggestions for you. What were some of the things that you were trying to do, like to improve on? Um, so having more energy, but mm -hmm. getting serious when I need to. Um, also starting on the right slide helped. Mm -hmm. Well, that helped, yeah. <laughs> um, and then... And just really just verbatim, not going off the slides. You know, one of the points Ruben made was, you know, don't try to reword things, just give it straight. So um was practicing that. And I think So so that can I comment on that, Jessica? That's interesting because um so so I my, my feedback to you was say it like it is. Uh, to, to, tell, tell me again, tell me again. I, 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 I have a vague have a recollection, recollection of giving you that feedback. feedback, 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 feedback. Help me remember. I, I went back I went to my notes, notes and I, I, I didn't find I didn't that. that. So I think it was a slide with um, the research, and I kind of reworded it to, in my own words. And okay. you were like, uh, make sure that you say exactly what's on the. Hmm. Okay. okay. Well, well. 
What, 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 I, what I thought, I thought, thought this, time, this time, Jessica, Jessica is, is, is that, that, that there were that times where it, where it felt like, you, like you, you were reading from, reading the, from script. the script. And um, uh, you did it in a very natural way, way that, that made it sound made it like sound it was like your own words. words. Um, um, but but, but, I, but I, I feel like I, feel like I, 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 I steered you steered too far in that direction. direction. Um, um, you, you know, so I, I think I there's... there's there's a a, 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 a a happy medium there um, because I think I think occasionally you might read from the script or you might you know for emphasis you, you might you might say hey on page seven it says blah 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 but but for the most for the part, part, you want to be in your voice. Mm -hmm. You 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 know you want I we do want it to be your words. Um, so I, 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 I fear I may be confusing you from last time, but um, I, 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 my, my feedback was not to have you read from the script. That was not what I meant. So maybe that's the main point I should make now is um, it, it's, it's fine to paraphrase and put it in your own words as, as long as the message is, 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 is the right message. Kelly, is this making any sense to you? Sort of. Um, I did mute you, Jessica, just to let you know. I heard an echo from Ruben. I wasn't sure whose computer it was, so you have to unmute to talk. Um, um, yeah, like I, she doesn't I, want me to talk. It's fine. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know why I was getting an echo from Ruben. I kind of understand what he was saying. I don't remember him saying last time about, um, about like, like stick to the script more. I looked at my notes, too, and I don't remember him saying that. I did feel I like you were more... more Right in line right with in the PowerPoint, PowerPoint, which apparently that's what you were trying to do. So, so yeah. you did that well, but I think there is a medium, a blend between it. Mm -hmm. And then when, when you're, you're at your workshop and not sitting your puzzle watching you, I'm sure you'll have that natural blend in there much more, much more smoothly. Yeah. But I think, but I think, you know, it's, it's a definite, definite, you know, know the material. And once we feel confident that you know the material, you understand it, then every workshop that you do, you're just going to find ways to add your own flair and your own stories and your own experience into it. Mm -hmm. Kelly, we're getting that echo. Again. Yeah, I hear an echo too. Yeah, I hear an echo too. I'm not sure. What's going on. Can you hear the echo I now? Know. I think we all have. No, it was you. Oh, was it me? I don't hear it now. Was it me? Yeah. If you have two computers oh. going, then it's probably. Yeah. Um, Alan, I would love to hear your feedback for Jessica. And then, yeah, well, uh, well Jessica, it was great to, to see you um, uh, perform, you know, because I missed a lot. I apologize for that. Uh, and, and obviously, obviously, I was being I was the name there. Right? I, was being the I loved it. Thank you. Um, to, um, to challenge you, and as we, as we get those coaches mm -hmm. um, occasionally. So, so I thought I what you did really well was the dress and dress. And, dress. and, and you didn't, you didn't uh, disagree or, agree or okay, you got to get here. here. Okay, so you, so you, you listened, you understood what I was where I was coming from, but then pointed me back into the principle. And I think that's really important. I think that's also where uh, where Ruben's coming from is is when we get into a discussion of the coaches, that's your opportunity to uh, you know, converse and talk with them in your own in your own words, and then putting them back onto uh, what we're trying to get across. And I think that that's that's really critical. Um, and Ruben, I, I I would I would want to give this some of that feedback. I think that sometimes we stray off our message um, almost too much, and we might skip over uh, a key part. So you, the amount of time that you spent on the effort, which I think is so critical, and I don't think very many coaches understand that, which is why I challenged it, I thought was really great. And that you, you did have somebody read something very specific. And hey, Alan, can, Alan, can I, Alan, can I jump in, Alan? Yeah. So, so just, just uh, I don't want to be misunderstood. So I think it is important to cover the content accurately and thoroughly. And Jessica, you did that in your last, um, I, I think you did that today. I wrote the script in that, on that PowerPoint, the trainer notes, the script, I wrote it. And sometimes today, Jessica, I felt like I was hearing exactly not only what I what I wrote, but the exact words that I wrote. Now I could be wrong. Maybe you weren't reading it, but 
I, I just, I, I, I uh, it, it sounded and felt to me like you were reading my words exactly as they were written in the trainer notes. Some of the time, not all of the time, some of the time. That's what it, that's what I thought I, I heard. And, and okay. So that, 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 that's my observation. Sorry, sorry for the interruption, Alan. No, no worries. No worries. There was like um, three main slides that I highlighted that had certain, you know, verbiage from the research and things that I wanted to make sure I hit. So I wanted to make sure that I got those correct. That I didn't reword them in my creative way. Um, so I wanted to make sure I hit those. So yeah, I'll do a better job of not exactly reading verbatim, but making sure that I memorize that so it's comes across more fluent and, and you know i just um, I just, um thank, you, jessica, thank you jessica and, and it, when you're, when in, a you're in a live shop i just don't I just know don't you're have that luxury, that luxury. To, to, to 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 read it exactly as it is i you know i don't know what kind of mode your presentation mode you'll have right but that that those trainer those notes and script are written are in a written way, way. They're, they're, so they're so detailed they're so lengthy, they're so lengthy. <laughs> It's very, it's very hard, hard to, refer to refer to them in a live in a live shop. shop. Right. Do, do, you, do you follow me on that? Hundred percent. Yeah. Like yeah. the first the first one we did, I pretty much didn't even look at the slides. And this one, there was like a few that um, I had. I don't know if what you what you said last time. My notes were. Um, don't use your own language, make sure you say what actually it is. And so I took that to heart and okay. I just wanted to make sure that I um, vocalized the research pieces because I think those are really important. I think that was a great point that you made, so. Well, uh, uh, before we get back to Alan, because I, I did interrupt Alan, Jessica, I appreciate very much that you, you took feedback and, and implemented it. I, I, and and the, the point I'm making, is not that this this demo was not was not good or strong because it was again you've, you've, you've had two really strong demos um, uh, I, I just I just wanted to point out what my observation and, and feeling was as, as in, and, and and that makes sense that the, the, there were a few sections so um, I'm not crazy it was <laughs> I what I observed um, uh, actually was actually happening. Was happening. Yeah, Alan, back to Alan, you. Back to you. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, one of the other one of the things, things I like, Jessica, is that, Jessica, is that you know, obviously you, um, you know us, I mean, but, uh, but you make, you make the, the effort to connect with someone directly. directly. And I think that when somebody has a question or somebody has a concern or maybe somebody's not talking and you want to call on them to get them engaged, you know, asking them their name or, or, or repeating their name once you know it, complimenting them on their challenge uh, is really good. I thought you did that really well. I, I purposely tried to draw you out in, in that situation um, to because that does happen. You know, it really does happen in our workshops and, and we want to encourage, I think the best workshops are when, uh, when the trainer and the coaches really have or the parents have a good dialogue. So I thought you were great at that. I, I think that I would encourage that that's a, 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 a great strength to be able to Alan, get it right into the crowd, even walk into the midst of them. Alan, can I jump in again? Because you're, yeah. you're triggering thoughts. Uh, uh, um, I, I thought I think that's a strength too, uh, Jessica, when you do that and when, when any trainer does that in the workshop, what Alan just described. And and what I might add there, and you're not, you're not going to do this every time. So this is this isn't uh, you should have done this today, but but just just have it in your arsenal um, that sometimes you you turn the question or the challenge over to the group. And as a right. group, we come up with. So, so, for example, Kelly's situation, which was an interesting situation. I have. Gosh, in, in 500 workshops, I haven't had someone say that my problem is the opposite. My, my oh, really? parents don't care. They, they, they don't care about mistakes. I, I have not had that. Come not, but, but I can totally see it happening. You know, if the kid's there because mom and dad made a play. So, you, you know, I think that Kelly's situation would have been a real interesting one for, wow. I, I, I bet you're not the only one who's encountered that. What, what, what do the rest of you think? What, how can we help Kelly with this situation? Mm -hmm. Because in, in my opinion, what Kelly brought up was an effort problem. It was not a mistakes or okay, mm -hmm. not okay problem. It went back to the E. It's mm -hmm. these players don't understand that 
to be a part of this team, there has to be some kind of effort expectation. And, you, you know, so, so anyway, that's, that's would have been my contribution would, would have been to get, Hey, Kel, coach Kelly, I think, I think you got to focus on effort and getting these, these players to commit to some level of effort. It might not be the same level of effort as all the other players who are crazy about soccer or baseball. But anyway, if, Alan, you, uh, you you, you triggered that in me too, Jessica. So that's, that's a trainer tool is okay. Let's, let's work on that together. What do the rest of you guys think? Perfect. That's my yeah. best tool when I, that's my best tool when I don't know an answer in my head that fast also. And then I'm like, Oh gosh, how will I answer that? Throw it back out to the coaches. And while they're answering, you have a chance to, you know, come up with a good answer in your head. And, you know, sometimes the coaches will come up with a better answer than you had. And you're like, exactly. That is exactly how PCA feels about that. You know, right. Right. Give, give the credit where PCA does, but it, it's like, oh, shoot, I don't know how I'm going to answer that question. So I'm going to open it up to you. And all. That, that <laughs> will happen over and over in workshops. You know, right. that, that some, someone will bring up something and in the moment you, you know, we, 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 uh, yeah, in the moment we don't have the fix and, and we don't put, we don't want to put our pre pressure on ourselves to have the fix to every issue or challenge or possible question that could come up in a workshop. Right. Yeah. And I've even done workshops for like baseball. I've never played baseball and I've done workshops before where somebody would ask me a baseball question and I'll say, okay. All of you have been coaching baseball way longer than I have. Let's hear from one of you. And I'll just put myself out there and say, I, I have honestly never coached boys high school baseball. So somebody needs to help me out here. And they do. And they're, they're, they like drawing on their experience. It makes them feel right. good. Like, okay, they can be the expert. Love it. Yeah. I made that point. It's great. <clears throat> all right, Alan, did you have any more before? I, I think Ruben might already be finished. I think he, he threw in all of his comments. Uh, oh, I'm you. sure I'll interrupt again. I'm sure he's got more. Um, no, I just, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm excited for you to be out here. And I think that, um, you know, we, we've got so many uh, workshops coming up this year. And I think you would be a really great new fresh voice for us. So Absolutely. I'm really thrilled Thank you for, for putting the effort, putting in the effort. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm excited. Okay, Ruben, did you have anything else to add? It didn't get checked off your list yet? No, he's good? Wow, he's on silent, okay. Um, Jessica, I think, I think you did a fantastic job. And I actually, in some ways, I liked the other one that you did a little bit better because I did feel like I heard more of your personality coming out. And I like it when trainers can take our information, but add in your experience. I mean, you've got a ton of experience. I feel like anybody can read what's on the slides the slides are really there as a visual, mm -hmm. just for the visual learners and to keep a structure to it. And I think if you say something completely wrong, like if you, you know, as I said before, I've heard people call it like the Positive Coaching Association. You know, if it's something blatant like that that's wrong, then yeah, we want you to stick to the slides. But I really like it when one concept to the other. Um, so I thought that was great. I love your choice of language. I think you do a nice job of keeping the pace going, but not too fast. Um, as you know, I'm a fast talker, so I appreciate that. But I thought you did a nice job of slowing down a little bit more today than you did last time. That was another like, point that you asked me to do. <laughs> yeah. No, I th thought it was good. I definitely felt like you were more calm. You were more relaxed. And when you're relaxed, the coaches are relaxed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes the coaches are like, <gasps> I'm exhausted watching you, you know, do this. <laughs> so I like that. Um, I liked the way that you used the word like strong evidence from Carol Dweck because sometimes I think I have a psychology background too and a counseling background and sometimes I feel like I push too much on the research mm -hmm. where a lot of the coaches in the room don't care about the bookworms at Stanford that are studying this stuff. They mm -hmm. want to know how will it help my six-year-old basketball players play better. Right. So I think when you said, you know, Carol Dweck has strong evidence and not to just hit home on the, the 20 years of research isn't why this principle works. It's mm -hmm. because the 20 years of research has led coaches to put this into practice and the coaches have said, wow, the right. performance is amazing. So I always make sure that I hit home that it is, it is backed up by research, but it is also coaches that have told us and we've seen the performance increase in every level. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think when we hit the research, they think, well, of course the athletes at Stanford are going to get better. You know, they're at Stanford, but will it help my little league players too? And right. Um, I really like when you said um, effort tied to commitment. I think that's something that is important and it's not written on the slides, but it's something that really hit home with me. I thought that was great. And asking yourself, um, you said like, ask yourself, do I know? Do I know that the commitment that the kids are, are giving and bringing to this? So I thought that was really good too. Um, I like that you asked Alan, 
when you're performing, what do they fear the most? I think that's a really big, big point to bring in. And I also would love to hear um, either you to bring out a story from us or you to have a story in your pocket ready to go. Because I think we need to make these principles and these tools come alive for people and storytelling is the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. so, so I think if you take, like before the video or the scenario, <clears throat> when you said, okay, you read the scenario and then you said, pair up and talk about it. Um, just something as simple as saying, okay, who's had the experience like this? Who's had an experience where your team has been playing tentatively? Tell me about it. What mm -hmm. does that look like? What would cause a team to play tentatively? Right. Um, right. You know, just asking them to put the principle to a person, make it personal, make them think of a player on their team or a team they've coached that was like this and have them figure out why. So I like to do that before the scenario to get them thinking about, okay, here we go. Now I know what you mean. Because sometimes it's the wording of like tentative play it's like, what does that mean? Is that aggressive? Mm -hmm. Is that not aggressive? So if they kind of talk about it for a minute, then when they talk about, okay, now we know the situation, mm -hmm. how would you handle it or how have you handled it? Right. Then they can chit chat, yeah. talk, and then you can kind of debrief. So make it more personal, I think is, okay. is more helpful. Um, what else? I like when you said, you know, when you had us read right out of the book. I mean, I think that's something that, that is a really great learning tool. And it, you know, opening up the book, can you read it for me? Um, asking for a volunteer to read it, never call on somebody to read it, which you know, because most likely you'd pick on the person that either doesn't speak English or can't read. So always make sure you ask for a volunteer that can read it. But again, you know, after Ruben read it, you're like, boom, that's it. Like, that's where I see your personality coming out. And that's, that's where like Jessica is talking to the coaches, not mm -hmm. the PCA lady. Right. And that's, that's where they're going to connect. So I think it's great. Um, Curtis Granderson also plays for the Dodgers now. And I think we need, um, just, that just made me think about it. Oh, okay. Um, Okay. We, we need to get that changed on the slides. Is that changed in PCA trainer share, Ruben? Do you know? It says New York Mets, so. It does, it does, yeah, but that's the do, probably. The, do, the Dodgers, Dodgers actually are looking at, we have to decide whether we're gonna sign them or not, so. Oh, oh okay. So can we, should we keep Mets there? No, no, he's now, he's now currently a Los Angeles Dodger. And, yeah. and it, it, you know, it could okay. change again. Uh, we, yeah. we, we should change that. Kelly on on trainer share. You you know how it is. It's or just even just a, put a note in somewhere. Yeah, I yeah. just changed it on my my. Uh, yeah. Slide. Yeah. I just I didn't I there I knew it from a couple I weeks ago and I forgot to I forgot to bring that up. But yeah, you're just something especially in LA, be, you just say Dan, he's here. That's what I was gonna say. Especially if you're in LA. <laughs> if you're in Philadelphia, nobody cares. But if you're in LA, right. people will care. Like, wait, I think he's here. What's going on? We can also, we can also, sometimes we put underneath them like major league baseball player because some of these players change so fast, you'd have to change your PowerPoint every couple weeks, so. Right. Um, but Jessica, you know, the point of this is for us to see and feel comfortable with you going out and doing this in front of live people. And I think between mm -hmm. all of us, we have no hesitations with that at all. I think you've got, you've got the en energy and the charisma and the experience, and you're just gonna get better and better every time you go. So we're really excited about it. The one opportunity that I do wanna let you have is that the both times that you've done these demos, you've done the Elm Tree of Mastery. So if you'd like to, um, we're, I'm gonna consider you an associate trainer. So we will assign you to do a workshop with a, a certified trainer. Okay. Um, when you do that, most likely we'll have you go out and do half of the workshop. So there's the introduction, um, emotional tank, Elm Tree of Mastery mm -hmm. and honoring the game. So you would be doing two of those principles. If you'd like okay. to run through the other principle that you didn't get a chance to do on your demo with me before you do that, I wanna leave that opportunity open to okay. you. Because sometimes it just helps to practice. More. Yeah, I could go through the um, whole thing. I, <laughs> I don't know if I have time to do all that, but yeah, you can do that too. But what I wanted to do while Alan was here, um, so what I do is you're, you're an associate trainer and I put you on um, an email that goes out once every, usually I send it about once every two weeks and it has all the workshops that are coming up. And I know it was a little bit confusing with where you are, where in the world is Jessica Crate. Um, mm -hmm. So if you want me to send you send you the Los Angeles workshops. I can send you the Tampa workshops all over the place. But I mean, aside from sending you all the workshops in the whole country, I'm not really sure organizationally how I would do that. And I'm also going to be in Utah a lot. So I don't know. Do you guys have anything going on in Utah? Um, usually if it's in Utah, it might be like one workshop. There, that, we don't have a chapter in Utah. Okay. So very rarely do we have workshops going on there. Well, I mean, you can send me anything. Just 
Like, do you have certain times that you are definitely like in LA for these two weeks and then in Florida? Is it a schedule or is it just depending on where your work um, takes you? For, so I um, just got accepted into this program and I'm doing a course in, um, in Utah and I'll still be in Utah for a week. And then I'm at a girls in the run summit for four days in Austin, Texas. So we do have a chapter in Austin. Perfect. Well, if there's anything in yeah. Austin, I'm there for four, four and a half days. Um, okay. And I travel a lot. So if you have like gaps that you want to fill and I'm like, okay, I can change my flight or have a layover here and do a workshop. I mean, I can make those okay. things work. And that's kind of the beauty of my schedule. But it's also a frustration probably for you because it's when am I in LA? When am I not? And right. So right. well, once you're a certified trainer, you can look on the schedule yourself okay. and see when the workshops are. So then you can apply for the workshops. Like if you know you're going to be in LA, you can apply for the LA ones. If you know you're going to be in Florida, you can apply for those. But okay. in the meantime, until you're certified, when we're trying to get you out to a workshop to co-facilitate, to get you certified, um, I send them to you. So you know when they are. Yeah. Is there anything in Florida um, next week? Because I'll be in Florida, in Tampa. For a few yep. Days. I'll send you those. Yep. Monday or Tuesday. So that's the, um, the eight and eight nine to the thirteenth. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. And if you just want to give me a heads up, like I'll send you those. I'll send. I'm going to send it out today. The list okay, of when perfect. all the workshops are. And mm -hmm. if you know, for example, like I'll be in LA from January 22nd to January 30th, yeah. or I'll be in Texas, just, just shoot me an email and I'll send you okay. the workshops okay. that are there in those areas. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks so much, you guys. All of you. I appreciate, I appreciate you jumping on and all your feedback and I'm looking forward to it. All right. Let's go. Well, stay warm. It. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alan and Ruben, for joining me. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. guys. Thank you. Bye for now.